Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Ideas about waste are changing all around us. And composting is playing an important part. You know, we need to recycle, we need to compost, we need to think about upstream um, diversion tactics. Just how cool would it be if you could bring in, let's say from a school, where they, everything on the plate was compostable. A pound of worms will eat a pound of food scrap a day. The best ones I've had are the ones I've set up and forgot about. For months, just I forgot they were even there. So for everything bad that we've created that we now have to take care of, we've got some really neat tools that help us work the stuff out. So it's gonna be, composting is, I think, something everyone's gonna be doing. Production of Farm to Fork Wyoming is made possible with the generous support of the Wyoming Business Council, Agribusiness Division, Rocky Mountain Gardening Magazine, and viewers like you. Thank you. La, la, la. Whatever the circumstances, there seems to be a composting method to suit the need. Erica Rogers makes it work indoors and out with worms. Worms, it's hard to tell the front end from the back a lot of times. Um, and this worm you see right here, it's got that fluid. <laughs> That's what these worms do if they feel threatened. And it, um, these are called Asenia fetida, because this is kind of a fetid odor and flavor to predators. Mm -hmm. And it just composts. It works in that upper, say, two feet of compostable material. Vermicompost is compost made by worms. Instead of using heat created by microbes, there's no thermal heat in vermicompost. It's just the material going through the worm. I, I sell it, but we try to use more of it on our own place. And that's the reason I started with the worms is anybody in Wyoming knows our soils are not the greatest. So to garden, you have to do a lot of work on the soils. And I just have always been fascinated with worms. When I was little, we'd go get night crawlers and sell them for bait. Now, if you're trying to do a high income, low labor business, it's not the business to get into. <laughs> in her ranch setting, Outdoor trenches are an easy way to get rid of all kinds of compostables. And we compost the manures more in these than we do our kitchen scraps. Oh. But what we like about trench systems, and you don't even need to dig it into the ground, you can have it all above ground if you want, but you can start it on one end and get it going, and then if you have more to add, you just add on the edge of it. So you never have to disrupt what's happening over here to add more. And you just can make it as long as you want. Um, this we just dug because that's what we felt like digging this, this long. And when you get to the far end, hopefully this end's now composted. So you start to harvest your, your finished product till you get to it and then leave them a spot and then you start bringing it back this way so you never have to worry about moving worms. They just constantly yeah. have that spot that they'll migrate back and forth. Yeah. When the wet spring flooded out this worm trench, Erica harvested the castings and moved them to a garden she's starting on the other side of her new property. So this we just put in, I don't know, a few weeks ago um, just to try to get some things started. And I was kind of hoping this will set up a little bit to show kind of what it looks like to start and what it would look like in the end. This over here is what I actually harvested from that trench we were just looking at. To the right, she is amending a garden bed above ground. Can you let this process for a year and then just go straight to planting? That's what my plan is for this one. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. I was just going to try to see if I could get this all turned into decent compost. Um, and then use this to plant in next year. I put the newest stuff on one end and then tried to build it to more aged manure and then piled them in the middle. This is where I dumped the worms. Oh, and it's so much cooler when you get down in the bottom oh, yeah. and they will migrate around and half the time, I don't think I have any in here till I find that spot that they have decided is ideal. And then they will just stay in that spot. Oh, there we go. Now we hit the spot. It's a nice one there. And there's a baby, baby one. That's always good to see, because then you know that they're hatching. Well, you can see little bugs. Oh, there's so many different bugs are gonna be in your worm beds. There is a worm egg. Oh, they're pretty big. Mm -hmm. The little egg capsule holds uh, between one to five baby worms. Every three months, your worm population will double. 
Of course, worms are hermaphroditic, so they're both a male, female in the one worm, but you need two worms for reproduction. Um, and each worm during a mating will then lay an egg capsule. They don't remove weed seed, that's for sure. So if you've got weeds, oh. the weeds will grow. What we're shooting for is in the end, you know, it looks like that. Well, I threw some pineapple in there. It's just not quite ready for them to eat yet. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do pineapple in an indoor plastic bin just because sometimes the acidity of it gets to be too much oh. for them in that small environment. Here, they've got plenty of places to move. If it would rain, it would be better. It would make it a little bit wetter. But you can see once you dig down in there, it's actually just yeah. kind of that nice Everybody's moisture. On to yeah, recycling. yeah. And so, like I said, they won't come up to the top because it's dry, but they'll work down underneath. And then you get a cool day when it's a little rainier, you come in and maybe dig it up and flip it a little bit if you want. When it goes through the worm, a couple of amazing things happen to it. The first amazing thing happens to it is that it is concentrated. So the nutrients that come out of the worm, the, the stuff that comes out of the back end of the worm, the worm castings, are completely different than what goes into the worm. So they have more phosphorus, more potash, more nitrate. They've got more of everything because the worm concentrates them. What we love about the castings, though, is if you side dress plants or if you do any of that, it doesn't heat. So you don't have to worry about, say, with a chemical, if you put it on, you might burn your plant, but the worm castings wouldn't do that. Right. Um, so when we do have castings and we're planting seeds in the garden or whatever, we usually dig our little row for seeds and then just sprinkle castings down in the row, lay the seeds on top, cover it up. It's not a very difficult setup. <laughs> it's kind of whatever your fancy, you know, whatever you have, however you want to do it. And these red wigglers acclimate to indoor tub composting as well. If you're doing, say, a tub system, you wouldn't want to set it in your yard, let's say, and leave it like this in your yard all yeah. the time, oh, no. just because the sun would be too much. But this is what my indoor bins would look like. Here's that shredded mm -hmm. paper. And you'd see the casting that's beginning. All of this dark is worm cast. Oh, this, okay. this bin I'm trying to think has probably been going a couple weeks as well. So anything that looks like actual dirt is actually poop? Yep, worm poop, poop, worm cast, yep. But if you dig down in there oh. and find that avocado, <laughs> then you find the worms because <laughs> they love the avocado. Oh now, if you overdo avocado, it's not good, but this was just an avocado husk I threw in there and they just Jeez. took after it, so. Boy, they don't mind hanging out together either. No, nope. they are definite um, family, a group. Okay, and then I go in, say once a month, and I just kind of shuffle things around and then add some more paper on top. With these bins, the indoor bins, you really wanna make sure your food scrap's buried because in the house it will attract fruit flies and mm. fungus gnats if they can get to it. So that's where you only feed the amount they can eat, say, in a week. So oh. you don't want to take a bag full of food into here. You would take a handful and feed it and then go check a week and then put another one or check every other day. And if they're eating on what you put in, like we saw there, you can add some more. Okay. But you don't want to add more till they're eating. One pound of worms will eat one pound of kitchen scraps or green wastes in a day. So you can have spectacular, spectacular productions out of, out of worm farms. And the funny thing is, you know, the worms, we like to think the worms are eating leaves. They don't eat any of that stuff. The worms are eating the bacteria that are breaking down that food. Mm. Um, and if the bacteria are breaking it down faster than the worms can eat the, what the bacteria have made, you're going to end up with vinegar and alcohol basically oh. in the bin. becomes really detrimental to the worms. So. Oh. So that's why I always feed just a little at a time in this type of a setup. Everybody should have a worm bin. If you do it right, uh, you don't have any flies, there's no odor. Now this one, you can barely see there's a little bit of a growth on it, which is called the clitellum, which is where the reproductive organs are. Oh. The head is always closer to that growth, that reproductive oh, okay. organ. Um, worms don't have teeth, uh, so they can't actually bite. They just basically 
eat the sludge that the bacteria and other microorganisms have produced when they're breaking down any of the compostable material. And the rest of it just goes right through their system, but they break it down. You know, they have a gizzard and they add calcium. Beautiful. Worms are spectacular. But they can go for a couple days where you don't really see any evidence of scraps? Uh, well, they could go for a month without being fed, actually, because they'll eat the paper as their food source. Okay. Um, so, but if you're wanting to keep a nice, lively, active colony, basically, of your worms, you'd want to keep feeding them a little at a time. About the amount of paper that we have in there in six months should look like that. It comes out in a almost a structural form. Again, not in square little bricks, but in nice little particles that are jagged and, and, and so there's air space. You know, they're great structurally. They're even better in terms of, uh, in terms of their, their mineral content. Uh, they're absolutely the best thing you can possibly have. And then, then I put that out and I sort the worms as many as I can out of that. <laughs> but if you look in here, you will see that there are plenty of worms that oh, are still, wow. you're never yeah, going to get them all. If you keep worm castings about anywhere from 30 to 50 days, there's no E. coli in them whatsoever. And of course it smells wonderful. <laughs> this is dirt. Oh, it's such a nice, oh it does, it smells really good. <laughs> and that's an extremely finished product if you don't want it quite so finished. If you could imagine that being about halfway composted, mm. you could use it in your garden because you're just adding the paper and stuff in there and worms will just keep working on it. Red wigglers are spectacular. Uh, night crawlers are not good. So you want to use the right kind of worm. Yeah. The basic garden worms and those night crawlers that we have in the ground will dig tunnels. So they like to go, say, 12 foot down into the ground in their tunnel, and they live in their tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll come up to the surface to grab some decaying matter, take it back to the tunnel to eat it. The red, red wiggler uh, is probably your best composting worm, mm -hmm. and it just composts. It works in that upper, say, two feet of compostable material. So that's about all the more you're going to have in one of these bins. They're so. easily domesticated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, they're hard to tag, but... <laughs> In Jackson, the cost of hauling garbage to Idaho has given rise to a serious waste diversion program. County, we divert 34% of our waste stream away from the landfill. And of that 34%, um, 15,000 tons, that's 15,000 tons that's being diverted. And of that, 9,000 tons are just compost. And so right now, that's just yard waste and dimensional lumber and manure. Their composting is handled by a public-private partnership with Terra Firma Organics. We manage the compost operations as a service. So like your trash guy would haul the trash away, we accept it and we turn it into a product. Our promise to the community is that A, we can give them a lower price of um, waste management, which currently I believe we're one of the lowest um, costs for trash in this community. So we're cheaper than trash, for example. We're cheaper than uh, recycling a plastic bottle. We are the cheapest form of mass waste management in this community and the environmental payoff to organic waste diversion is huge. When organics go in the trash, it's, it's no good. Uh, organics, as they, when they go in the landfill and degrade anaerobically, they produce methane. Mm -hmm. Methane's a greenhouse gas, 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide, so we want to keep that out of the trash. And there's no reason for us to haul um, organics 100 miles when we can process it here in the valley. And hosting collection events, helps raise awareness while increasing diversion. So we run two events a year um, where we say, okay, we're collecting yard waste, uh, town of Jackson in Teton County, and we're offering free collection. You bring it to us, we'll take care of it. And it's amazing, the, re the response has been amazing. The last three events, we've collected nearly 100 tons in a matter of days. 
the end product is tons of quality compost. We produce products that otherwise would locally be shipped in, in plastic bags and things that have been blown over the place. And we provide a premium bulk product for somewhere around a third to a half the price that you could buy it at, at the box stores. They own that, so they have skin in the game, and they sell that from uh, another location here in the Valley. We're always thinking of the backside, the marketing side, because without a good marketing component for moving your product, the, the front side is, it, it's, it's more at risk. If you can't move the back, you don't even want to bring it in. Um, we've seen facilities, I've, I've visited so many facilities throughout the US, I've seen facilities where product is given away free, and I am shocked that people do that, mainly because of just economics 101. If you say a product is free, people usually don't want it. If you say it's $15, they say, well, will you take 10? That's 10 more dollars than you would have gotten when it was free, and they ex they're excited about it. Um, so our product currently sells out every year, um, and we're actually trying to expand so we can take on more. So um, as you can see, in this yard, we've segregated piles. There's a couple reasons we do that. This we would sell off um, and not use in our compost, and this makes up probably 50% of the entire waste at the Jackson Hole facility. If you pan over here, you can see this pile is what the finished product, or one step in the finished product. There's another one over there you may not be able to get a glance of, but um, the blonde stuff, that's been reprocessed down. This goes out to like the Home Depot supply operations that color it and sell it to those groups. So we've marketed it to those groups for that. We could compost it. Um, it's, it's still a carbon product. It's, it's not that much different than the brush that we'll talk about next. The other reason that we separate this is that on average the moisture content of kiln dried lumber is somewhere around 11%. So when we start to get into the composting process, a term we use is homogenize. So when we like to, when we want to homogenize our piles when we go into our pre-blends, we want to try and match our nitrogen and our carbon as best we can. The nitrogen's coming in somewhere above 50%. The brush usually is coming in somewhere around 30%, up to 50%, depending on if it came out of a forest product project or not, this at 11 takes a lot more moisture to get up to that point. Uh, I assume in time as we go into food waste, we will probably move towards this material as a compost um, component because it can absorb a lot of the moisture that comes with the food waste. Mm -hmm. The food waste is going to probably come in somewhere in that 80 plus range in moisture. Mm -hmm. So we feel that this could be a pretty good component to blend with that. Um, over here, we have our brush pile. We're pretty adamant about not accepting soils in this pile. You can see there is a little bit of soil here. That driver was told how to fix the problem. He goes off and tries to do that. If people come in and want to dump trash or want to dump soil, what we believe in is we don't say no. We say at what cost. So if, if you just don't care, that's okay. It just costs you more money. We're not here really to be the, the trash men up for the town organic operations. I've seen those done in other communities, um, and it's really hard to get trash out when people don't have any incentive to get trash out. But normally we'd have our grass pile, which is our nitrogen. We'd have our brush pile, which is our carbon. We would blend those at a proprietary blend ratio that uh, goes into what we call pre-blend, which is the pile you see over here to your left. And then from here, it will go into what we call hydration. Mm -hmm. The hydrating will be uh, a large tractor that comes in. It goes through, blends it up in a big blending type mechanism that's shooting water into the material, getting it up to a 50% moisture. And then we go into static management. We don't do um, windrow processing here, but it's a very finished product. Smell it. What's that smell like? Dirt. Exactly. Good compost, finished compost, looks, smells and feels like dirt. Uh -huh. If it looks like horse manure, it's probably horse manure. <laughs> if it smells like horse, horse manure, manure, it's probably horse manure. There's, it's a very stable, there's not a lot of carbon left, there's hardly any nitrogen left, mm -hmm. which is kind of a big misnomer when, you, when people buy compost, they're like, oh, I need that to fertilize my yard, and I'm like, well, it's not fertilizer. Yeah. It's not, there is, there's hardly any nitrogen, no top producer in this product. But depending on management and inputs, a feedlot manure-based system can finish with higher levels of nitrogen. Often, and not always, but often a manure-based or a food waste-based compost will be higher nitrogen, lower carbon, typically. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Whereas a yard waste, if there's a lot of shredded branches and wood chips and various things in it, it will often be a higher carbon, lower nitrogen type of material. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's um, sometimes you need extra nitrogen to balance it out in the field, or maybe it just takes longer to break down, or it's better used as a mulch as opposed to incorporated as a soil mm -hmm. amendment. It adds some crumb structure to the soil. It helps so it's not too tight. And it also continues to feed it a little bit. It gives it a little bit more to break down. Mm -hmm. So as the, as the bugs in the soil and as they're getting more nitrogen from the atmosphere and we've still got a little bit of carbon in there, we've still got more to happen. But in Jackson, there's another high nitrogen input on the horizon. In 2020, we're gonna establish a municipal industrial food waste composting facility here. And so when we're able to bring on food waste, it's even gonna be a, a much larger impact. And with Teton County's four million tourists a year, there's a big opportunity. As we've been around the community, engaged interest, and tried to identify who's gonna um, be psyched to do this. The Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, they would do it tomorrow if we could do it, because that's gonna save the money by not throwing food in the trash. Um, trash fees around here are, are, are pretty high, so the less trash they make, the less they pay. Um, so they're in, uh, the hospital is very interested. Um, we're hopeful of speaking uh, with the school district to get support from them. Um, and then of course the restaurants, we've, we've talked to several restaurants in town that are real interested in, in not throwing food waste away. It's very much a part of a growing mindset in Jackson and beyond. Uh, to me, it's just never been an option. We had to, we have to do something and we gotta do everything we can. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky that I've got so much support from yeah. my company and the community and the way we sort of interact with our surroundings. I mean, we live in an amazing place. And so we really have to be extra mindful about the impacts we put on it. Initially, we'll just target um, the, the bigger producers. That's where you get your numbers. You know, it's, it's not so much the mom and pop that's separating a sandwich here and a pop bottle there. It's the industry that's delivering 10,000 sandwiches to the park. And when, you know, a percentage go bad, they're already set up to just go and it comes here. We did a study to find out if we did this, what does the low hanging fruit provide us between a school, the largest, one of the largest hotels in the state, um, two stores and a couple restaurants, we diverted their waste stream by 50%. That's massive. And that was not post-consumer, that was pre-consumer. That's nothing coming back on the plate, that's everything before it goes out. So this is one of the bins. Um, the ones up top are on rollers because that kitchen's a lot bigger. And so there's a lot more workstations, and so they'll just take it around with them. Uh, this one's nice and small, so they just get to keep it like right here, and uh, it's nice and concise. And yeah, right now it's looks like some tomatoes, some watermelon peel, some habaneros, avocados. So we got the looks like a mixing making some like a little salsa salad going right here. So <laughs> but this just it was actually really easy. We had enough of the infrastructure. Um, already set just because of the natural way we have to do things that when we introduced you know the, the the food waste component it was just like you know my warehouse manager Dan's like eh, red bin black bin green bin I don't care <laughs> you know, so. to me it starts with source reduction so getting away from as much of the packaging and all those kind of things it, it kind of all starts there I don't think we should change a thousand people or a million people's minds on how they deal with trash we should change the design of how we accept our trash using compostable products, um, not allowing, for example, a good one would be plastic bags. It's a horrible use, right? It's a, it's a stupid design. They work great, but in my opinion, they should ban them because they just end up everywhere and we can't get them out and then they're in the ocean and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, it's this problem, right? Um, so our, our goal is, is to start helping with the buying side to say, what of this can go into a compost operation and not affect it negatively? Because how cool would it be if you could bring in, let's say from a school, where they, everything on the plate was compostable, including the plate maybe, who knows? And it just, they, they scrape it off, and all of that can come to us. There's not a lot of, of cost and process to get that material cleaned up. We then can compost it at half the price that you can take it to the landfill for, and we have products to sell locally. It's a win-win for everyone. What's important 
for anyone that's looking to do this, including myself, is to be honest with what you can accomplish and not go too far and promise, oh no, it's not gonna stink, or we're not gonna have problems, or we're not gonna have vector issues with bear and other things. Mm. Um, so the challenge is gonna be receiving, dealing with a product that stinks, and then getting contamination out. Because it's one thing to pick plastic out of not very stinky wood, but to pick plastic out of stinky rotten sandwiches is pretty gross. Again, back to your question of the challenge, it's gonna be on the receiving side because we're surrounded by bears and birds. How do we uh, manage that? We're probably gonna to have to do some kind of a small enclosure. That enclosure will have reversed airflow that will pull air off of the pile and run it through a biofilter, which looks very similar to this wood pile. It'll just be air that pumps underneath a bed of chips and it diffuses it through the chips and it's filtering out all those little molecules and things and it, over time we change that out, but it basically degrades it um, and it cleans the air. And then uh, that material goes into blending, very similar as our other, and then it will go into a aerated static pile and that's just forced air underground. It's pushing air through it all the time. You want an aerated pile so it degrades faster and doesn't produce methane gas. That's really the goal at which we go for. But every little advancement you can make, people are like, oh, like, all right, that's cool, let's do that, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it's getting people excited about it. Yeah. And keeping them excited about it. It's gonna be really working with who wants to be a part of this. And our goal is to convince the convincible at first and work with the people that care and want to do this. So yeah, we've, we've come to realize how important education and outreach is, and it, it shows when you put concerted efforts into that, you notice immediately. To watch and learn more about this and other episodes of Farm to Fork Wyoming, go online to wyomingpbs.org forward slash farm to fork. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available for $25. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content.